This is just the welcome slides, it looks like. So, I think you just find yours in here and. You're in the section too? Yeah. I'm not getting a little all oh, not supported thing, so that's. Yeah. You'll find out. Can I check yours? Sure. Nice. On the edge here. Yeah, that's updated. How's it going? Yeah, I think you just log into the Zoom and then I'll let you know. Also, can you put up the challenge? Is that good? Okay. That's okay. Oh, it's good enough? Okay. I was just trying to get it. Even, no, no, we have Let me hear it. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. All right, I'll try to remember. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. One, two, testing one, two. Who's the chair for this session? I'm the chair. Oh, you're the chair. Ah, oh, okay, yes. Um, I saw that, yeah. And, uh, and this thing? Did you I don't know how to use that counter yet. I think we just go. Oh. oh, you just put zero zero in. Oh, oh, that was well said. Uh, 
If you could please use uh, I I got it, yeah. Okay, everybody, we're going to get started. Take your seats, get comfy, digest that food. All right. Um, yeah, this session is going to be on various topics related to high energy astrophysical phenomena. Um, we're going to start things off with uh, David Jones. And for all the speakers, when it's three minutes, five minutes, and one minute before your 12 minute thing, I'll annoyingly raise the sign. So, yeah, take it away, David. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, I'm really excited to be here in person, and thanks so much to the leads. It's been an amazing two years and some, and it's great to meet all of you in person. Um, this is a talk based on a paper that uh, will hopefully be submitted right after the session, so um, might be. <laughs> we'll see, along with the companion paper from uh, Justin Perel, who's here at the Institute. And also thanks to STSI for assembling all the co-authors on this paper in one place. Uh, Darcy used to be here, Midai is at Hopkins, um, Justin is here, and Matt Siebert is a STSI fellow here as well. So uh, work wouldn't be possible without them. Um, so I wanted to talk about the relationship between type 1a supernovae and their host galaxies very quickly, um, but the underlying motivation here is because we want to learn about fundamental physics through the lens of the Hubble constant and the dark energy equation of state in particular. Um, so the Hubble constant, the local expansion rate, uh, can be predicted from the cosmic microwave background sound horizon. Um, then if we take what we know about the cosmic matter and energy budget, the laws of general relativity, 13 billion years of time, we can get a prediction for what uh, we should observe the Hubble constant to be today. And if we go and actually measure the Hubble constant in the local universe, uh, we find uh, currently from the Shoes collaboration, which I'm a part of, that it disagrees with the CMB prediction by about five sigma. Um, with the dark energy equation of state, uh, David Martin showed a dark energy pie chart during his exoplanet talk last year, but unfortunately not this year, so I have to do it myself. And uh, um, so we're very curious about this 70% of the universe made up of dark energy. In particular, um, there are huge uncertainties on the uh, possible redshift dependence of the dark energy equation of state. Um, if you just look at kind of a simple parametric model even for with these W naught and W A parameters for how dark energy might evolve with redshift, there are kind of huge uncertainties um, in that parameter space. This is uh, work I did with Dan Skolnick a few years back. Um, and so this all kind of comes down to um, type 1a supernova distance measurements in many ways. Um, and this is a very recent dark energy measurement from Dylan Brout. This is the Hubble diagram of distance modulus from type 1a supernovae as a function of redshift. That shows the results from about 1,500 uh, supernovae spanning cosmic time. Um, so these type 1a supernova distances can be used to infer h naught and w. Um, but what I want to talk about today is one of several possible systematics in their distance measurements, which is uh, the fact that these distances appear to change depending on the masses of their host galaxies. Um, so this is uh, the Hubble residual, so distance modulus minus the predicted distance modulus from lambda CDM as a function of host galaxy mass. And what we're really worried about here is the difference between these red lines, which is about uh, 0.06 magnitudes. So it seems small, but it's uh, generally larger than the difference that 
uh, we're actually trying to measure across cosmic time due to uncertainties in cosmological models. Um, and so why supernovae should be correlated with their host galaxies, it's not really clear, but it could be they have changing progenitor metallicities, um, different explosion mechanisms. Uh, uh, popular theory lately is uh, different reddening laws due to extrinsic dust. Uh, Dylan may talk about that uh, later this week. Um, and these could give uh, systematic uncertainties in H naught and W. And I don't want to be too alarmist. You know, we control for these things. Uh, we, we generally trust our measurements. But if you have galaxies evolving across cosmic time and your supernovae depend on your galaxies in an uncertain way, that's inevitably going to cause some degree of uncertainty. And so the point that I really want to make in this talk is that our supernova distance model doesn't actually know anything about the host galaxies. Basically, you know, we take some model for uh, how supernova light curves translate to distances, um, and then we look at the correlation between various host galaxy properties, and we're astronomers, so then we fit a line to it, and this is what we have. Um, so we can do this in a different way. We can go back to the underlying model itself. Um, so that's what I've been working on over the past few years is uh, starting with the SALT-2 model, which is kind of the industry standard supernova distance model uh, for measuring cosmological parameters. Um, it standardizes type 1a supernovae by modeling them with a zeroth and uh, like kind of a mean spectrum and then a first component for intrinsic variation and then a color law. Um, it was kind of developed in the early 2000s, uh, periodically trained with new data, but not so often recently. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the creator of the code went and left for uh, Desi. I think he's very happy, but we're very offended. And um, it's written in object-oriented C++, so it's not super fun for uh, me, at least, to look at. Um, so I've been working on uh, kind of rebuilding this code from SALT2 to SALT3. Um, in particular, expanding the wavelength range, um, improving the photometric calibration of the model, which is kind of our limiting systematic in this dark energy pie chart here, um, and adding new data to the training code. Um, and so we did this in 2021, led by Darcy Kenworthy. Um, and in particular, this is now like an open source code that we can train and retrain in the coming years when we get amazing supernova data from the Rubin and Roman observatories. And this is an in prep paper from a uh, uh, Georgie Taylor here that shows the SALT-2 systematic surfaces due to photometric calibration compared to SALT-3 and were uh, factors of a couple lower with this new model. So we should be able to do a lot more with cosmology. Um, and in addition, uh, we extend the wavelength range to the Z-band, which means we predict to get about 20% more usable observations from uh, the Roman Space Telescope Supernova Survey. Um, there's kind of a 10-ish percent precision increase from the new model, which accounts for, or which is equivalent to about 30% more data. And so that's especially exciting when we're in these kind of uh, data limited regimes, like very nearby type 1a supernovae with Cepheid distances. Um, and there's also going to be a near-infrared SALT-3 model from Justin Perel um, on the archive this week. Um, and this plot on the right-hand side just kind of shows uh, these precision increases in the red from SALT-3 for some of the uh, subsamples that are used in cosmology analyses. But what I wanted to talk about today, really, um, is with the SALT-3 model, we can build host galaxy relationships into the model itself. And so this is kind of a complicated um, table really should make this uh, simpler for talk purposes, but it shows we have a lot of supernova data, more than 100 supernovae 300 spectra at uh, host galaxy masses of less than 10, which is kind of the typical splitting point for this supernova distance relationship, and um, uh, 900 spectra at host galaxy masses greater than 10. So we have a lot of data with which to kind of build a host galaxy surface into the model. So very simply, uh, we have kind of the first principal component or zeroth principal com component is function of phase and wavelength. We have a intrinsic variation surface. We have a color law. And all I've done in this work is just add a principal component that depends on the host galaxy properties and then, uh, you know, define priors such that none of these things are really degenerate. Um, so what this looks like in practice is we have a mean type 1a supernova spectrum, we have some first order variability on that spectrum, and then we have a host galaxy component. So after all of this work, um, you know, what comes out of this training process? 
Um, this is basically the spectrum at maximum light of your average supernova in a low mass versus high mass host galaxy with a low mass hosted supernova in blue. Um, you can see that these things are very similar, which is, of course, good, and is why these things are, uh, these types of relationships are difficult to parse out. Uh, but there's some differences in the line profiles, like calcium H and K here, um, some difference in the widths of uh, silicon 2 at like 6,200 angstroms. Um, and so we found that those, those had uh, differences um, at kind of the two sigma level, which indicate higher, uh, higher explosion energies in low mass hosted supernovae. Um, Additionally, you can see that these lines uh, evolve with phase, minus 5, plus 5, plus 15, plus 25, and the color of these uh, spectra starts to shift as well. So probably going too quickly to take an in-depth look at these things, uh, but this is what the B minus V color actually does uh, with time between your average high mass hosted and low mass hosted supernova. So you can see there are significant intrinsic color differences as well that we can take into account when we're modeling distances. So, um, well, let me go back just really quickly. So we've kind of gone from a simple one parameter, thanks, one parameter prescription for understanding host galaxy, the supernova dependence on host galaxy properties to a much more complicated procedure that's baked into the model itself. So then we can see what effect that actually has on our distance measurements. Um, and so, here, what we find is that the size of the host galaxy mass step, the distance residual shift a little bit, and the size of the mass step decreases by about 30%. Um, and this just shows the Hubble residual change from uh, the old model to the new model as a function of redshift. And um, the kind of good news out of all this is that our distance precision isn't changing that much. Um, and most of the host galaxy dependence, it appears, was already captured in the previous model, um, but with a different formalism that kind of convolutes the mass step with uh, Hubble residual trends with shape and color. Um, but there are still some significant spectral changes, and so this is kind of a plot as a function of phase of the features that we weren't um, capturing in the previous model of supernova distances. Um, from uh, low phase at the bottom to a uh, later phase at the top, and especially like in kind of the silicon 2 and calcium H and K regions, uh, there are some missing features, and so we can use that as a basis to understand at which redshifts these are impacting our broadband filters and how that might affect the distances that we're getting out. So uh, that's pretty much a very quick synopsis of this paper, so it should be on the archive, I think, um, tomorrow night. So please check it out if you're interested. And I think of it really as giving us a new tool to um, kind of understand both supernova cosmology and potentially supernova physics and kind of take a deep dive into different supernova correlations with different host galaxy properties at different redshifts ranges at C to what extent these relationships evolve, um, and also work on near-infrared and UV model extensions. And so it's also part of just like having a lot more supernova data coming in the coming years, um, and so it gives us a chance for big data approaches to some of these really old questions in supernova cosmology. Thanks. Great questions. I think just so the people online can hear you. Here you go. How much more supernova do you expect on the new surveys that are going to come out with the new telescopes? Uh, particularly the Rubin Observatory is in the order of uh, hundreds of thousands. Roman is more like 10,000, so a lot, yeah. Um, I guess the, the deep fields for uh, Rubin will be more like 10,000 maybe, which will have a little better cadence and stuff like okay. that, how and some good low-Z samples. How many too. do we have now? Um, the plot I showed from Dylan's paper, which is kind of the latest, greatest W measurement, is 1,500. Um, Thank yeah, you. There are a few more out there. but Also, I went this whole talk, and I forgot to highlight our SALT-3 logo, which is a salt shaker pouring out supernovae, which is also from Matt Siebert, who's here at the Institute. Any other questions? So maybe you said this. Uh, like how, by how much could the distance ladder actually change within like errors or uncertainties? I'm, I would say I'm significantly more worried about the dark energy equation of state because it's, it is a more sensitive measurement and it's kind of harder to control uh, for 
redshift evolution of galaxies or to know how galaxies evolve from redshift zero to redshift one to redshift two. The distance ladder, basically the game that we try to play is um, we look at um, galaxies in the final rung of the distance ladder that could be Cepheid calibrators if we only had like a large enough telescope with enough, enough sensitivity. So if there's no difference in how we select things between the second and the third galaxy, uh, third rung of the distance ladder, then we would hope there's not a big effect here. You know, maybe there may be still some ways it could hit you a little bit, but um, but yeah, I don't I don't think it would change the Hubble constant too much. All right, Ryan. Then question online. Yeah. So um, uh, I'm wondering, can can you explain like you you mentioned like potential uh, metallicity differences uh, in the galaxies having something to do with this? Um, what's the physical way that that relates to the the white dwarf explosions? Like I understand how massive star evolution is affected a lot by metallicity with mass loss and things that affects core collapse, but the, the yeah. type 1As are basically, they're already like all metal when they explode, right? So I'm curious what the connection is. Yeah, so I'm very much not an expert, but I think if you change the carbon oxygen ratio, it can change the amount of nickel synthesized in the explosion that could have some systematic effect. But yeah, cool, thanks. It's, it's usually described in kind of a hand wavy way. I see. Okay. Uh, yes, sorry, no, there are no questions online, but uh, I have a question of my own. Uh, so um, you're mentioning the correlations that you find with the uh, host galaxy properties, but I'm wondering, like, is, has there been effort looking into whether these are more locally uh, concentrated in the host galaxies rather than, you know, in the sense that, you know, do one is happening close to H2 regions, the younger populations look yeah. different compared to things in bulges and so on, like, it, or is... Or is it just too difficult to do that at this stage, given the numbers? No, there's there's been a lot of work on this, um, and I was definitely time limited. But um, it's kind of an interesting question in the sense that, you know, core collapse supernovae uh, don't live very long. Um, and type 1As, some of them have a very long delay time. So they could have moved a long ways from um, the place where they exploded, and that's why you see them in early type galaxies. But that said, you know, some of them, the prompter explosions could still correlate with you know, the area of their birth. And there has been some work suggesting that they're a little bit more uh, correlated with their kind of local environmental properties. But it's usually, it's a tough game because it's usually like 0.01 mag, 0.02 mag, right? And it's like I found this, you know, published four papers, each of them with a one and a half sigma result. All right, let's thank David again. All right, and Eric is gonna follow up. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes. Cool, thank you. Um, yes, thank you very much. All right. Okay, um, is that displaying online okay? Can I move this at all? I guess I can. <laughs> I can only move it left and right. <laughs> uh, it's, it's okay, I think, for now. If it, I think it should be fine. But, okay, can I start? I'm good. Okay. Uh, well, I, I'm going to apologize because I, I am in this kind of like vague high energy section, but I actually changed my abstract. So instead, I'm going to be talking about something I'm calling the principal components of metal poor stars, uh, which sounds a little obtuse. So I'm just going to start with the star for which we have the most data, and that is the sun, the solar system. So this is um, a plot showing the abundances in the solar system of each of the elements, and they are in log space, so just be careful. Uh, and what we see in the solar system is evidence of many generations of chemical evolution. We have these records of things like Big Bang nucleosynthesis, of different generations of stellar burning, and things like supernovae, where we get all this iron. Uh, but then there's all this other stuff, like two-thirds of the periodic table that we can't really account for with fusion. Uh, 
about two-thirds of the, well, these two-thirds of the elements are primarily made by a mechanism called neutron capture. Uh, that can be specifically broken down into two different types, a rapid neutron capture process and a slow neutron capture process. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about that at all, which is very uncharacteristic for me. I love talking about the R process. I just want you to know that about half of these very heavy elements, so half of these, like, two-thirds, are made in some type of rare 